Hello, my name is Bartram Brown. I'm professor of law at the Chicago Kent College of Law, and I'll be speaking about the Keobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum Company case, which will be argued for the second time before the Supreme Court on October 1st. Well, the factual setting of this case, uh, well, begins with uh, in Nigeria, in the Ogoni region of Nigeria. It's the oil-rich region there, and a number of oil companies have exploited uh, pumped oil in this area. Uh, and this case is brought by some residents of the Ogoni region who allege that their human rights were violated by the Nigerian government in the form of torture, extrajudicial killings, uh, arbitrary detention, uh, crimes against humanity. And importantly, they allege that these violations were committed by the Nigerian government with the assistance, with the aiding and abetting of these petroleum companies. So on this basis, uh, a lawsuit has been, a uh, tort suit has been filed in federal courts here in the U.S. against these oil companies. Um, now, normally when this kind of thing happens, human rights violations around the world, the people often have no recourse. Uh, here, there's this possibility that a tort suit in the United States could provide that resource, and that's one reason this case is so important. But why should the federal government exercise jurisdiction over events that took place in the Ogoni region of Nigeria? And this is, of course, the question. Uh, and the answer, well, part of the answer lies in an obscure jurisdictional statute known as the Alien Tort Statute, passed in 1789, one of our earliest laws. And basically it says that the U.S. District Court shall have jurisdiction over any civil action by an alien for a tort only committed in violation of the law of nations. Now the law of nations is the old term for international law. So basically this statute from 1789 gives U.S. courts jurisdiction over violations of the law of nations uh, which may constitute a, court, a tort. Uh, this obscure statute has in the last 30 years taken on great importance. There have been a number of lawsuits brought in U.S. federal courts under it uh, alleging human rights violations abroad and seeking a tort remedy. Now the history of these cases begins in about 1980 uh, with the Flartica versus Pena Irala case, the first such case, and that involved a p policeman who tortured people in Paraguay and he was sued in New York uh, by the family of one of the victims. Uh, and the case was allowed by the Second Circuit uh, because they found that torture was currently recognized as a violation of the law of nations. Uh, of course, it wasn't recognized as a violation of the law of nations in 1789, so there's this dynamic nature of international law changes and more things potentially can become torts under international law and jurisdiction under this alien tort statute can expand. And that's, of course, what this whole series of cases is about. Now, originally, now some have argued in subsequent cases after Philartica that the scope of these uh, alien tort statute claims should be limited to matters which were violations of the law of nations in 1789. Uh, that would be a very short list, probably including, well, certainly including piracy and uh, basically uh, acts against diplomats uh, in violation of diplomatic immunities and so on. Maybe a couple of other things, but not much. So if that was the list, wouldn't apply to any of these modern tort claims based on human rights violations. Uh, and so that issue was out there, but the Supreme Court ruled on this alien tort statute for the first time in 2004. Uh, and uh, in 2004, that was the Sosa versus Alvarez Machine case. This case involved a Mexican doctor accused of assisting in the torture and murder of a U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration uh, officer in Mexico. Uh, the U.S. government believed that this doctor had, you know, was responsible, and they basically paid someone, uh, Sosa, to kidnap him in Mexico and bring him to the United States for trial. Uh, well, that case against him was ultimately dismissed, and he brought an alien tort statute claim against his kidnapper, Sosa, saying that the arbit his arbitrary arrest and detention violated international law, and he should have a remedy on the alien tort statute. Supreme Court ruling for the first time on this statute uh, basically allowed these cases, but uh, with certain limits. And in particular, they said, well, yes, it's, it doesn't provide a cause of action, but it merely jurisdiction. The Alien Tort, tort Statute merely provides jurisdiction over a limited number of violations of the law of nations. 
And again, what's, what's, what's on that list? What qualifies as a violation? And must rest on a norm of international character accepted by the civilized world and defined with specificity. So it can't be general allegation. It has to be a specific norm generally accepted by the civilized world. And as the court said, uh, uh, and, and arbitrary arrest and detention basically was found not to be such a norm. So torture, yes. Uh, arbitrary arrest and detention, no. And it should be noted that his period of arbitrary arrest and detention was maybe a couple of days at most, uh, which weakened his claim there. But allowed these cases to go forward, uh, but with a high standard to be met, a norm of international character, uh, broadly accepted, specifically defined. And that brings us to our present case, Kiobel. This case raises for the first time before the Supreme Court the issue of alien tort statute liability for corporations which may have aided and abetted in human rights violations. Uh, so the Second Circuit uh, uh, applied the SOSA test uh, to determine, well, is, does this case rest on a norm of an international character that's generally accepted, uh, and decided that corporate tort liability is not a principle of international law. Uh, and on this basis found that it had no jurisdiction over the case and the case was dismissed. Well, yeah. A principal issue here has to do, well, as I say, is this question of corporate tort responsibility. And basically there are two views. One view is that, uh, and that's the view endorsed, by the way, by the Second Circuit, which is that, yes, not only must there be violations of internationally recognized human rights, but international law would have to recognize independently the principle of the tort liability of corporations for such violations. Uh, something that's unlikely to be found in international law because there are relatively few international legal norms specifically applicable to corporations. Um, and so if indeed it's a jurisdictional matter, uh, it would be a very high barrier. Now the merits of this case had been argued before the Supreme Court before. On October 1st, they're simply going to be looking at this jurisdictional issue of is uh, this matter of, of the tort liability of corporations under international law a jurisdictional issue or is it an issue of the merits? And that is a matter that's going to uh, be decided today. Now the petitioners argue that um, once they have made a plausible allegation of human rights violation, a non-frivolous claim uh, of a tort in violation of the law of nations, that that should vest the court with jurisdiction, and then it should decide on the merits, decide the case on the merits. Uh, as I say, the uh, respondents and indeed the Second Circuit take the view that no, uh, it's, a, it's a jurisdictional issue, uh, and if we don't have this norm of corporate responsibility recognized under international law, there will be no jurisdiction. It will go no further. Well, what's at stake here? Well, basically, you know, there are two views. Uh, the downside, what are the potential, what's the potential downside of these suits of corporate tort responsibility under international law? Well, of course, you could have a vast extension of U.S. federal court jurisdiction uh, to matters around the world, could overtax the federal court system, could even violate the rights of other countries by conflicting with the jurisdiction, the territorial jurisdiction of other states, which is a, a potential problem. So some say that's what's at stake. There might be this overreaching of our federal courts. On the plus side, though, what are the possibilities? Well, this has the potential to revolutionize the enforcement of international human rights around the world. If US federal courts, again, I mentioned before, normally there's no recourse. Uh, in many countries around the world where you have these types of human rights violations, especially the worst ones. But the possibility of a tort claim before U.S. federal courts could radically alter the prospects for some kind of justice in these types of cases. Uh, so that's what's at stake, and it's indeed very important. Uh, and we'll see where the Supreme Court does come down on this.